What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It is your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat BDGE fantasy football. I'm dropping this on Monday just because I happen to have gotten it done on Monday. Your man's didn't go out Saturday night, thus I was feeling good Sunday and got a large portion of this video, this blog, which you could always find on BigDogsFantasy.com, done on Sunday. So I was ready to roll on Monday. Figured I'd get the video out, give you guys an extra day to get prepped for your waiver wire. This is the week 11 waiver wire video, breaking down position by position, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, defensive streamers. As always, all of these players are owned in 55% or less of Yahoo leagues. So let's get into the video. Before we get started, first I want to acknowledge No Shave November. We aren't not shaving, but we ain't shaving the curls. I know you see some crazy shit I got going on, on top of my head right now. We no shaving the curls November, all right? I suggest y'all grow out your curls for November as well. But we have a giveaway. I haven't done a giveaway on my channel in a long, long time, and I know y'all deserve it, especially if you're hanging with me all the way until week 11. I appreciate that. I love you for that. So we're going to give away a custom jersey. And you know I'm linked up with my man, the Jersey Jungle. These are custom. Oh, you know, I got the fly ass Jamal Anderson, some retro dirty bird stuff. Whoever wins this, you are, you are going to get your pick of any custom jersey you want. NFL, NBA, MLB, whatever it is. You get to choose any player, any team, any sport. Doesn't matter. All you have to do is go follow myself and the Jersey Jungle on Instagram. You have to follow my personal Instagram account. I mean, you could follow my fantasy Instagram account as well if you want to, if, you ha if you're not already. But I want you to follow my personal Instagram account, which is just at Nick Ercolano. And I want you to follow the Jersey Jungle. So at the Jersey Jungle. And if you don't care about the giveaway, if you just want to cop one of these jerseys, which they started like 40 bucks. And guys, they're like fully stitched. And I know people get mad when I tell you it's authentic. It's not literally authentic. Like the NFL didn't make them, but they're the closest thing you're going to get to authentic jerseys. They're like, you know, you got that one friend from like a couple years ago who's like, yo, I can get you any jersey any team, authentic stitch, all that shit. That's what I'm doing for y'all right now, but they are much, much cheaper prices. If you wanna grab one from the Jersey Jungle, all you gotta do is follow him on Instagram and then DM him. If you tell him that I sent you, he will give you free shipping. So you're really paying like 40 bucks for an awesome. These things are liter literally the closest thing to an authentic Jersey you can get of any kind. You can get them custom, whatever you want. Follow him, follow myself. That's all you gotta do. And you will be entered into the contest. I will pick the winner probably maybe next Monday, uh, next waiver wire video. If you just want to cop a jersey, like I said, slide into his DMs. He does not have a website yet, I believe. So that's how you order. Just manual, face to face. I know you millennials might have some problems doing that, you know, actually conversing and whatnot, but you got to do it if you want the goods. Anyways, let's get into our top waiver wire videos. First up on this list, as always, is the quarterback position. Dak Prescott, 35% owned. Now Dallas and, uh, and, and Dak, you know, they're hitting a little bit of a hot streak over these last few weeks, at least statistically speaking. Now, Dak threw for 270 yards and a touchdown. He also ran in the touchdown um, and added about 10 yards on the ground on Sunday Night Football. Now, over the last month, like I said, Dak is, is streaking a little bit statistically. He's averaging nearly 23 fantasy points per game and is quarterback six in fantasy football over the last month, since week six. So he's been quietly very, very, very good in fantasy. I think some of it has to do with the fact that now he has a legitimate number one wide receiver in Amari Cooper. You saw throughout the beginning of the season, his targets were being dispersed. You know, one game would be Alan Hearns with six. The next game would be Michael Gallup with six. Now we're seeing Cooper get, you know, 10 targets, eight targets, like a legitimate wide receiver that can beat outside cornerback ones. And I think this is, you know, this is a really big help to someone like Dak who didn't have any weapons in his offense. Now in week 11, Dak has an absolutely... Gorgeous matchup in Atlanta, in the Dome, against the Falcons. We know that their defense, decimated by injuries, has been miserable all year. I went back and I wanted to look at some of the quarterbacks that they faced and the numbers they've given up. They have allowed two opposing quarterbacks. They have allowed three or more passing touchdowns and or 300 passing yards to all eight of the last eight quarterbacks they have faced. So since week one, they had that shitty week one game where Nick Foles was a quarterback. But since week one... 300 passing yards and or three plus passing touchdowns to every single quarterback they have faced. They've allowed 20 plus rushing yards to five of the last eight quarterbacks they have faced, which is obviously part of Dak's game. He, he adds that rushing floor as well as rushing ceiling to his game. Dak is getting hot. Now is the time to stream him, to get him into your lineup 
for week 11. Number two on this list, Marcus Mariota of the Tennessee Titans, 30% owned. Now, the way I look at Marcus Mariota, he's kind of an enigma, right? I feel like Mariota has three, three modes. He has really bad, really good, and hurt. And I feel like those are the only three that we get out of him. However, right now, he is kind of on that really good spectrum. Um, and he, we as fantasy players tend to have recency bias, right? And that's what we're going to have with Marcus Mariota here. Because it's only a matter of time before he has that really bad game. And then we're like, fuck, we can't use him ever again. So, right now, we're going to ride that really good mode of Marcus Mariota. On Sunday, Mariota threw for 228 yards, two touchdowns. He added another 42 yards through receiving and rushing. Uh, whatever, uh, we'll take it any way we can get it, right? In fantasy, don't matter where the points come from. The offense is rolling, and they get a big divisional game against um, Indianapolis next week. And while the Colts' defense has certainly improved over, you know, the perception of the last few years, they are far from good at stopping fantasy quarterbacks. If you exclude Week 7 against Buffalo, because it was Derek Anderson on their quarterback, and I don't want to take that kind of stuff into my analysis... Over the last five games, excluding Week 7, India is allowing 312 passing yards a game to opposing quarterbacks, as well as a 12-4 to touchdown to interception ratio. And you could add on three rushing touchdowns, which, of course, again, just like Dak, Marcus Mariota has that in his repertoire. So this quietly looks like a very, very good matchup for Mariota in Week 11. Indianapolis' offense has been firing, which means Tennessee is probably expected to put up some points as well. So I really, really like Marcus Mariota as a streamer in Week 11. Next on this list is uh, Eli Manning. He's playing on Monday Night Football. So I don't know what's going to happen tonight. Eli Manning could throw for like 47 yards. Um, but the fact that he plays against Tampa Bay at home in Week 11 makes him streamable. I have no further analysis. Next up on this list, Jameis Winston of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 11% owned. Obviously, everyone dropped him once he was benched and Fitz became a starter. Dirk Cutter's dumbass came out after Sunday's game and said to the media that he had taken over play calling duties for this game. This was the first time all year. Now, their offensive coordinator, Todd Munkin, has done a phenomenal job of play calling this year for the Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And their offense had been rolling for the most part. Now, they had over 500 yards of total offense and scored three points. So, Dirk Cutter comes out and basically says, I'm the reason why that happened. I would be very surprised if Dirk Cutter makes it to the end of the year, let alone the end of this week. If that happens, if there is a coaching change, and I don't know who's going to take over. Hopefully, it'd be Todd Munkin. That'd be pretty cool. But I don't know who's going to take over. Whoever it is, um, is almost certainly going to make a quarterback change. And they're going to let Winston come back as the starter. Uh, Fitzpatrick threw for 400 yards in this one, uh, which is the fourth time this year he's done that, which is fucking incredible. But he didn't score at all. Uh, he threw two interceptions, you know, couldn't lead them to a victory. And, you know, it's only a matter of time before Fitz start throwing up dud games. If he does continue to be the starter, I would throw it at a 95% chance that Winston does end back up in the lineup as a starting quarterback for multiple games by the end of this year. So if you're in a two quarterback league, Winston needs to be owned right now. Even if you need to bench him for a couple of weeks because he might not be the starter in real life, I think he needs to be owned in all two quarterback leagues because he will be back under center eventually. And given the group of weapons, we've seen what Winston's ceiling is like as a quarterback, right? The first game back this year, he was quarterback one in fantasy on the week. So they play at New York this week. San Francisco, Carolina at home. A lot of good matchups coming up on the schedule. So yeah, Winston needs to be owned. The next guy that needs to be owned, which is also another kind of weird situation, is Lamar Jackson of the Baltimore Ravens. Right now, 7% owned. Now, Flacco's hip injury, we don't have a lot on the, on the matter. But they did just have a bye week. So it's possible he's healthy coming off the bye week. But we've also heard reports that it might cost him a game. It might cost him two games. We don't really know what that would mean. We also don't even know if Lamar Jackson is actually going to be the quarterback here. But... They have Lamar Jackson and Robert Griffin. Robert Griffin actually played very well in the preseason, um, but Lamar Jackson added a ton of rushing. Every time he gets in the game, he adds a ton of rushing yards. He looks horrible throwing the ball from what I've seen um, in, the, in the very small sample size we have of him in the NFL. I'm not worried about that because when you have a guy like Lamar Jackson who's adding so much rushing floor and ceiling to your lineup, he is a must-own guy and probably like a top 12 to 15 fantasy quarterback going forward. I think he's a guy who's going to add 50 to 75 rushing yards and maybe score every other game. That being said, if he does, if Flacco is out and he does get the start for the Ravens coming off their bye, they play at home against Cincinnati, at home against Oakland, and then at Atlanta. Probably the 
easiest slate of three fantasy defenses you can go against. So I think Lamar Jackson needs to be owned. This could be something where Lamar Jackson, you know, you pick him up and then all of a sudden we find out that uh, Joe Flacco is starting and then Lamar Jackson doesn't see the field. That's going to suck. But I, I do think Lamar Jackson will probably see the field at some point, especially if the Ravens keep losing games and they start um, spiraling out of control. So Lamar Jackson is someone I definitely want to pick up in my leagues. And that wraps up the quarterback position. And we'll move over to the running back position. And the first name or two names on this list are Mike Davis and Rashad Penny of the Seattle Seahawks. Before we jump into that, I want to thank today's sponsors for the video. As always, fantasyjocks.com. Y'all know what it is. You know what they do. They're the, they're the GOAT when it comes to fantasy sports equipment for your league, for your fantasy football league, basketball, baseball, don't matter. They got all of your leagues covered regardless of the sport, championship belts, rings, trophies, draft boards, if you do live drafts with your boys or homets. I don't want to discriminate here. So check them out. All of their stuff is very, very, very high quality. It's really not expensive. If all of your league mates ship in a few bucks, you can get yourself a trophy, a ring, a belt, and you can have the previous um, champion's names engraved on it. doesn't matter if you buy it now. You can have the last five years running, including their actual custom team names. You can get the belts customized to your league name, people. This shit is a must-have if you are in a serious fantasy league. And if you're not, you get one of these and it just became serious, bruh. That's a fucking slogan. They should use that shit on their website. I don't know what I just said, but I know it was good. Use Take 10, promo code Take 10, or Taco Court for 10% off your purchase. Your man's has got you. Thank you, FantasyJocks.com. First up on this list, as I said, Mike Davis, Rashad Penny of the Seattle Seahawks. Now, Mike Davis is owned in 52% of leagues. Rashad Penny is owned in 14% of leagues. Um, and I guess it's crazy to say, but I think at this point, all three Seattle running backs need to be owned in fantasy football. They are just such a high volume rushing team. They pounded it into us all summer that they want to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. And everyone's been making fun of them about that, but they've actually made that a thing. And they are the highest volume rushing team in the entire NFL this year, which means they can't support multiple backs. Here's what I, uh, it's really, really tough to decipher. And this could be a running back situation where I might avoid altogether. If you are desperate at running back, I would definitely try to pick up whatever you can out of this backfield and see how it turns out. Like if you're starting fucking Isaiah Crowell in your RB2 role, try to pick one of these guys up and um, see what happens over the rest of the year. What I would say right now is Mike Davis is a clear backup to Chris Carson, but Rashad Penny played very, very, very well on Sunday. And I think that would mean that he's in more line, he's in line for more work, right? They use their first round pick on him. And that by, by no means do I think that means that they have to give him it, but you get a longer leash, right? Anything that excites the team that you're like, oh my God, our first round pick looked really good. We should be giving him more work going forward. So it's like you get more leeway, you get more of a leash. And I think like anything that happens is kind of exponentially hyped up, if that makes sense. So um, Rashad Penny rushed 12 times for 108 yards on Sunday. Mike Davis only carried the ball 11 times, but he did have 15 touches to Penny's 12. So Penny outrushed him 12 to 11 and outgained him by almost double the yardage, but Davis still saw 15 to 12 touches. And Rashad Penny, for the first time this year, didn't look like fucking Eddie Lacy on the ground, right? He looked shifty. Still looking thick with two Cs, but he looked shifty. He has the vision, which is what made him such a high-value prospect coming in, right? He's a guy who can play all three downs, and he's got quick cuts, and he's shifty, and he makes guys miss. And we saw that on Sunday. Now, I know everyone is going to get super high on him, but if Carson is healthy, it's Chris Carson's job. Right? He beat out Penny in the summer. He's been the starter all year while he's healthy. So I still think this is very much Chris Carson's backfield here. Um, and the other part is like, even if Penny gets more work, Mike Davis is still the preferred pass catching back here. We're, we saw it on Sunday. We saw it the week before that. He's caught 11 balls and had 14 targets over the previous two games. D Davis absolutely needs to be owned in all leagues too. I, I think it, it, like a lot of it is obviously going to come down to Chris Carson being healthy. Now, Chris Carson, if he's healthy, is like, yes, he's a lead, lead back, but he keeps opening up the door given the fact that he can't stay healthy and uh, and he's been injured throughout his career and he has a tough time staying on the field. So it's like, you want to have Chris Carson in your lineup, but he keeps giving Penny and Davis the chance to have big games and they keep having big games. So it's going to be hard for them not to have a three-headed monster going forward. If he's out, I prefer Mike Davis for sure. I think he has double-digit touch floor 
um, with probably RB1 type volume ceiling going forward. The thing about Chris Carson is this, it's like Chris Carson's injury is, is far more serious than the reports that we're getting out of, out of camp. Like immediately after the game, they said to you, he's not going to practice all week, but he's going to be a game time decision. There is no shot in hell that he was playing this week. There's no way he's not going to see a single ounce of practice time and then suit up. Like there's no way he's healthy enough to do that. And now they play on Thursday night. So I would be shocked if they're not practicing whatsoever. Uh, if he suited up for Sunday night, I think maybe he'll get like a limited practice in Wednesday and then they'll be like, oh, he's a game time decision. And then he's not going to play. That's my prediction. How this is going to work out. Like it doesn't, I, I don't know how people aren't making more of a deal about this. Like he literally didn't do anything all week. And then they're just going to say he's a game time decision. Like, no, he can't even, he probably can't even move right now. Like, okay. So I just think Chris Carson's injury is way more serious than we are actually getting from the media or the reports from the Seattle camp, which is often the case. Pete Carroll likes to, you know, disguise things and, and I don't know, say shit out of his ass all the time. So I think both of them have value. I think Rashad Penny, I think people are going to get really excited about Rashad Penny and think that he has like RB1 value going forward. I don't think that's the case. I would rather own Mike Davis right now because by the time Rashad Penny works himself into a bigger workload, Chris Carson will probably be healthy. Mike Davis is still there. That's all I got to say about this. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm probably going to end up being wrong because that's what just happened to fantasy football. You, you understand that you can't understand anything, I guess. So I would probably drop 10 to $15 if I need running backs on either of these guys that are on the waiver. Second up on this list, and I hate, I, you hate to see it. You hate to see it. Derrick Henry, 48% owned. I hate him. And I think he sucks. Him and Jamal Williams, Eddie Lacy, Trent Richardson, all the fat boys, uh, they are a trend that NFL owners just love. They love these these thick these thick running backs who they put up on the goal line and they think that, oh, because he weighs 30 pounds more than the next back, all I have to do is give him the ball, let him literally turn around and, and fucking go in backwards into the goal line, and that's more effective than someone who actually has vision. Like, that's what LeGarrette Blunt is to carry on Johnson. Like, oh, let's give LeGarrette Blunt the ball on the one-yard line because... He's heavy, and even if he fucking does a 180 spin and tries to go in backwards, which is what you see, because they get stuffed at the line, and then they just try to, like, get in. But meanwhile, you got Karrion Johnson, who can see holes that are, like, in a centimeter. Getting away from the point. But Derrick Henry on this Titans offense, and as I said with Mariota, this offense is starting to roll a little bit. And if that's the case, Henry is going to get fed, both literally and figuratively, because they're going to keep scoring and they will give him scoring opportunities. And that's the only, literally the only thing that makes Henry a valuable fantasy asset is the fact that they are now getting more goal line opportunities. He has four touchdowns over the Titans last three games. They have pretty much all been goal line one, two, three yard runs in. Deion Lewis is clearly the RB1 here getting far, far, far more touches than Derrick Henry playing on far more snaps than he has. But if you're desperate during the bye week, there's no one that you're going to find on the waiver wire that has more touchdown likelihood, I guess, if you want to say, than Derrick Henry on a uh, on a weekly basis. So uh, you could do worse than Derrick Henry, um, but you could also do way better. So that's what I'll say about Denver, Derrick Henry. I am not someone who likes to depend on touchdowns from any of my positions, so I'm not as high on him, but do what you want to do with that. Next up on the uh, running back list is Doug Martin of the Oakland Raiders, 45% owned right now. Admittedly, admittedly, Doug Martin doesn't look terrible when you watch him play, but their offense, on the other hand, the Oakland offense looks, makes up for how bad you thought Doug Martin would look is how bad the Raiders offense looks squared. What's the word for three times? Man, I've been out of school for so goddamn long. If something, a number is squared, what's the... Did you just say to the third power? No, there's there's a fucking term for that. What's the term? For, someone drop a comment down below. What's the term for three to the third power? How am I forgetting this right now? What's wrong with me? All right. Anyways, I, I have my MBA in, in marketing analytics. All right. So don't, don't, don't judge me and act like I didn't graduate school or nothing like that. Anyways, this Raiders offense has scored a combined nine points in their last two games. They have scored 10 points or fewer in four of their previous five games. Um... So, you know, 15 carries a game for Doug Martin is not going to get you much if none of them have a chance of getting into the end zone. Jalen Richard has maintained that passing down role, uh, but Martin, you know, has has pretty much added since Marshawn Lynch went down around, you know, one to three catches, so around two catches and about 20 yards per game through the receiving side of things. 
Uh, and the Raiders will arguably take on the NFL's worst rush defense in Arizona in week 11. Now, I would say it's a good game script for them, but even like the new and improved Byron Leftwich, you know, play calling Cardinals might be too much for this Oakland Raiders team and defense to handle. So I'm not even going to say it's a good game script for Doug Martin, but he's getting a lot of touches. Again, you're not going to find a lot of guys on the wire that get this many touches on a weekly basis. One guy who does, surprisingly, is Frank Gore, man. Frank Gore 2020. I I'm, I'm good to elect Frank Gore into office in 2020, and I think he should be the first president that is in office for multiple terms. Considering he's immortal and considering he's going to live till about 294 years old, he could be the next 50 presidents for the United States. It is incredible that Frank Gore is still in the league. I don't understand it, but he's 27% owned, and I think he should be more highly, more owned, more highly owned, I guess, than 27% because Frank Gore is, is gutting out. Nothing, nothing else. Add him to your team for swag points. And I will keep putting him on this list. He is a staple of this blog post. Like when I copy over, when I'm like, okay, duplicate blog post, he is the one piece of content that actually stays week over week. Like the format of the blog post carries over and I just take the HTML text code snippet from Frank Gore section and then I just put it into next week's section. And that's what's gonna keep happening. Now, Gore carried the ball 13 times for 90 yards, 6.9 yards per carry on Sunday. He caught two of his three targets for 13 yards, went over the 100 total yard mark for the Dolphins, man. Um, he has next to no fantasy ceiling. He has literally like no fantasy ceiling. He scored just one touchdown this year. It was a receiving score in week four on 126 total touches on the year. His floor though is about 12 to 15 touches. Isn't I like? There's really no difference between Frank Gore, Peyton Barber, Doug Martin. They're all in pretty bad offenses. They all don't really contribute in the passing game. They're all just like bleh. So if you're gonna pick one, you might as well pick Gore out of respect. And I tweeted this out earlier earlier today. So on Sunday, Frank Gore averaged 6.9 yards per carry in that game. That's the third time this year, in 2018, that he has averaged over 6.5 yards per carry in a game. Third time this year. I was looking back at his game logs. He has not averaged over 6.5 yards per carry in a game since 2013. That was five years ago. Gore is like arguably having his most efficient season as a running back in a long time. It's pretty incredible. Um, that being said, he does have a bye in week 11, so it's like you're not gonna go crazy over him and he offers no ceiling, but I just figured I would name him on this list. Last running back to keep on your list, had to add one more, um, just to keep on your radar is Josh Adams of the Eagles, and I talked about him last week and the week before. He looks like the best running back in the Eagles' backfield. Uh, the problem is how valuable even is that? He went seven for 47 in their game on Sunday, um, and it was the second time in a row that he's led the backfield in carries and been the most efficient at that. However, Smallwood and Clement are still very much in the mix, and they will continue to be going forward because Doug Peterson just uses running back by committee, so um, I'm not going to get too crazy about it. Like, I have no inclination that he's going to be, you know, a league winner or an RB1 going forward, but he's someone that I think has more upside than People probably realize because he's like very, very highly unknown. He's probably only owned in about 5% of leagues. Darren Sproles is, at this point, they might as well put him on the IR. I highly doubt we see Darren Sproles at any point during the regular season this year. So um, it's a three-headed it's a three headed backfield. If one of them gets hurt, then Josh Adams is probably plugged into a guaranteed 12 to 15 touch roll in that backfield. Just someone to keep an eye on. Uh, but let's move over to the wide receivers. And we're going to talk about, we're actually, you know, we're going we're gonna to get into a topic that's a little bit controversial right now in our country. And uh, and it's it's abortion. I'm just fucking with you. It's Devontae fucking Parker, bro. Devontae Parker. This Miami wide receiver group, actually. It's Devontae Parker and Danny Amendola. Parker is owned in 20% of leagues. Amendola is owned in 44% of leagues. Before I dive into them, actually, uh, my man Noah, who has been a blogger for Big Dogs since the summer. I need to close this goddamn thing, um, who has been a blogger for big dogs throughout the summer is going to be joining me on Thursdays, vi Thursday videos from now on moving forward throughout the rest of the season. Some of y'all might follow him on Twitter at FB God. I know he's starting to gain a little bit of a following, which is dope, but he's going to be joining me from, he's in college right now. So he's going to be joining me from wherever on the Thursday videos from now on this Thursday will be another trade target video. It came to my attention last week that I thought most of the trade target or trade deadlines were last Saturday. However, 
a lot of them, and I looked at some of my leagues actually, they are until like the, this Saturday or the 24th or whatever. So those are still open. So we're going to do those as long as they are, as the deadlines are still open here. So he's going to join me. I want to know who your favorite trade targets are right now, either buy low or sell high. So drop a comment down below and we will take those into consideration when we are doing our own trade target videos. So Show some love to my man's Noah. Uh, go follow him on Twitter at FBGawd, G-A-W-D. And uh, y'all will see him on Thursday's video. So I'm excited to bring him on to the facial side of things. And I didn't mean that how that came off. So we're going to get back into the Miami wide receivers. Parker and Amendola. Uh, now, who would have thought that I would be telling you to pick up multiple Miami Dolphins wide receivers? Now, I definitely wouldn't pick up both of them. But they are both viable pickups. And that is with Brock Cockweiler at quarterback. This is incredible. This is incredible. It's it's crazy when you think about things that happened throughout the year, and then you look back and like, imagine I told you this in the summer. Shit's crazy, man. Shit's crazy. Um, but Amendola. Amendola has been quietly a stud in PPR leagues over the last five games, over the last month or so, since Osweiler has taken over as the quarterback. From weeks six to ten, here is Amendola's per game statistics, 8.2 targets, 6.2 receptions, 61 receiving yards, 0.2 touchdowns per game. That's 13 and a half PPR points per game. Uh, he has never had less than 9.3 PPR points in a game in those five weeks. He's even been good in half PPR, 10.4 half PPR points per game. And you will take that out of a wide receiver three or a flex any day of the week in a half PPR league. Over that span, he is wide receiver 13 in fantasy football in PPR leagues. He's simply getting it done. We have Albert Wilson, who's already on the IR. Jakeem Grant looks to have his Achilles, so he is next online to be placed onto the IR. This wide receiver group was very muddied in the beginning of the year, um, and now it is not. And it's a boost for Amendola, of course. The concern for Amendola for me would be the fact that he's been putting up all these numbers with Osweiler at quarterback, and now Ryan Tannehill is probably close to returning. They had their bye in week 11, and some reports say that he's going to be back in week 12. I would probably err on the side of him not being back in week 12, which is a good thing. Um, they play at Indianapolis, and like I've said before, they can be beat through the air for sure through fantasy quarterbacks and wide receivers. So I like Amendola as a stash in PPR leagues. And on the flip side, we have Devontae Parker, who has not been great, but he did see 11 targets on Sunday. And he's now locked into a near every down player with um, the injury to Jakeem Grant. So it'll be Stills, Parker, and Danny Amendola in three wide receiver sets. Parker will be on the field all of the time. Now, Parker is pretty much boomer bust, right? He saw nine targets in week eight, had that big receiving game. Then he went invisible in week 10. And now on this Sunday, we saw him get 11 targets. I think um, Parker would upgrade, would be an upgrade if Tannehill is back under center, whereas Amendola, I think, would take a little bit of a downgrade. Usually outside receivers tend to get better in fantasy as the quarterback is better. Now, Tannehill is by no means good, but he's definitely an upgrade from Brock Osweiler. Usually the worse a quarterback is, the more they rely on those short dink and dump passes, and they are bad at throwing the ball outside because that takes a lot more accuracy to do that. It's just... It's just, it's common sense here, people. So I'm not really excited about this offense whatsoever, but um, like I said, we're finally narrowing down just by natural selection, just by um, just by evolution, right? Newton's law. I don't even know if that's the right person <laughs> We talked about evolution, but um, since everyone's injured, we know actually who's playing on the field now, and we don't have to guess week to week who's going to get the snaps and whatnot, and there's a lot of targets to be had in this offense. So I think Amendola and, and Parker are both decent pickups. They do have a buy, so you might want to wait another week before you do that. Second on this list is John Ross of the Cincinnati Bengals, owned in 17% of leagues. AJ Green's going to be gone for a while. There was reports that came out that he's probably not going to be back until December, which means he's going to miss at least the next two games. Um, that would put him back week 13 at the earliest, week 14 possibly, and I'm going to be down, and there's a reason that I put Tyler Boyd on my sell high list, on my sell high trade target video last week, um, because with Green gone, with AJ Green gone, this whole offense suffers dramatically. He stretches out the entire field, and it hurts everyone while he is out of the lineup, because Tyler Boyd moves to the top target, and so on and so forth, and whatever. Um, regardless, someone's going to need to step up, and someone's going to need to 
take over the targets that A.J. Green left. Ross will be one of those guys to do that. He led the team with six targets on Sunday, which isn't really saying a lot when your team leader leads the team with six targets. Um, and he only caught two of them, but they went for 39 yards and a touchdown, and it was Dalton's only touchdown pass on the game. So John Ross is a guy to have on your radar. I'm probably not adding him unless it's like a, a desperate 12-team league, uh, probably closer to a 14-team or 14 team or bigger. They play Baltimore, Cleveland, Denver, so it's not necessarily easy matchup for him, especially if he's operating as a wide receiver one there on the outside. Just someone to have on your radar. The next guy who should have been on your radar since the summer, because you know your man's hyped him up like a motherfucker, Anthony Miller of the Chicago Bears. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a long breakdown here for you, so stay with me. 12% owned, 88% available in Yahoo Leagues. This was Miller's first Miller's first game of the season, eclipsing 50 receiving yards. But, man, man, did your boy go off. He caught five of six targets, 122 yards, and a tutty. That tug was the fourth of the season, and he is quietly on pace for nearly 700 yards and eight touchdowns. That is a pretty damn good rookie season. It's taken him a little while to get the momentum going, but now he is Rolling, 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 rolling. What Biscuit would be proud as a MF. And Miller's getting more and more involved in this offense. His targets over the last four games, seven, seven, six, six. He's seeing six targets a game consistently every single game. Over, you know, and I really broke this down in terms of snaps and things like that. So if you check out this tweet I put out this morning, from weeks one to six, before week seven, he did not play in 60% of the Bears snaps in a single game prior to week seven. From week seven to 10, the last four games, he has seen over 60% of the team snaps in every single one of them, and he's averaging about 72% of their snaps. Even with Allen Robinson back on Sunday, Allen Robinson played 95% of the snaps. Miller actually saw a season high 74% of snaps. Uh, in week 10, he also played a season high 37 snaps from the slot in week 10. I just said week 10 like four times just to get the point across for me that it was this week. And we like recency bias here in fantasy football. 37 snaps from the slot, which was a season high. All of his production came from the slot. All of his five catches, 122 yards, and a touchdown came from the slot. If they're going to give him more slot snaps, he's going to keep producing. There have been five games this year in which he's had 28 or more snaps from the slot. He has scored a touchdown in four of those five games. That is it. The guy has a knack for the end zone. I've told you, I told you that all summer. He's someone who's going to keep scoring. One of my bold predictions was that he was going to score eight or more touchdowns. And I think he's going to keep doing that. If he keeps rolling in the slot, Trubisky's going to keep using him, seeing those six to seven targets. If he can get more and more snaps, man, if you could see him in that 80% range, 85% range, I think Miller would do absolute damage. I think he's someone who's going to keep getting better as the season progresses, man. Now, the one caveat I will say here, and also if just want to say this, if you want any of these crazy like um, statistics, if you want to do your own research, all of these, all of this stuff is per Pro Football Focus. the The snap percentages are per FantasyInsiders.com. Fantasy Insiders is completely free to you uh, for you guys to use. An awesome research tool. If you go on FantasyInsiders.com on the drop down menu, there will be uh, a drop down option that says player usage. So just click on player usage and then you could look at all these different teams and their snaps and things like that. In terms of like snaps from the slot and what your production was from the slot, this is per Pro Football Focus. They're, um, it's actually their premium package. So that will be linked down below if you wanna, it's like a 10 or $5 coupon on that if you wanna sign up for it. Really, really awesome, useful tools. So check that out. What I was saying is while everyone's getting super excited about Mitch Trubisky and this Bears offense, they have played arguably like the easiest slate of passing defenses over the last five weeks. Like you couldn't have had better games and game scripts for Trubisky to succeed. Um, and I don't want to take that away from him, but the fact that like people are looking at him as like a top five, top six fantasy quarterback, I think is a little ridiculous. And I think we're going to see really who he is and what this offense is against Minnesota this week. It's a home, it's a home matchup and Minnesota hasn't been lights out against the pass, but it's better than all the games that they've been playing in over the last whatever like Detroit without Darius Slay it was like Buffalo uh New England where they have to score a lot of points it's like all these ridiculously easy matchups for Trubisky so I like uh I like Miller going forward but I wouldn't get crazy crazy high on the Bears offense as a whole and it wouldn't surprise me to see Trubisky to kind of take a step back in week 11. Next up on this list is Dante Moncrief 10% owned he's pretty locked into the wide receiver one here in Jacksonville 
Um, as coming with the territory of being tethered to Blake Bortles as your quarterback, he's extremely boom or bust, but we saw the boom on Sunday. He caught three passes for 98 yards, including that 80-yard touchdown. So you see the upside there. And he has scored double-digit half-point PPR fantasy points in five of nine games this year, two of which were over 17 fantasy points. He's also had 75 or more receiving yards in three of their last five games. He's definitely a desperation play, but like I said, boomer bust, but he gives you way more upside for a player that you normally find on the waiver wire. Plays Pittsburgh at home next week at Buffalo and then home against Indianapolis over the next few weeks. Last up on this wide receiver list, actually there's a few more names to talk about, but last concrete piece of this wide receiver list is Josh Reynolds of the Los Angeles Rams, 1% owned. So he is available in pretty much every single league. This is obviously on the heels of Cooper Cup's injury. He has torn his ACL. He's going to be out for the year. RIP to the God Cooper Cup. Things will continue as usual. Rinse, repeat. It's a well-oiled offensive machine here. The Sean Mc McVay offense in LA. Um, that's what we have here. Now, Cup originally hurt his knee in week six, and he missed week seven and week eight before returning to week nine. With Cup sidelined, Reynolds just went right into the offense. He played around 85% of the offensive snaps. And as fantasy football usually does, it does not reward owners who think one plus one equals two. That's not how it works, right? So those who inserted Josh Reynolds into you know, their lineup for Cooper Cup in week seven finished with one catch for 19 yards. Then you were like, ah, fuck Reynolds. This isn't how it's going to work. They sat him. And then the next week, of course, he catches um, two touchdown passes in week eight. So you're going to get those boomer bust weeks just by being in this ridiculously good offense. Now, the key here for Cup being out is the fact that the three top wide receivers, which are now going to be Robert Woods, Brandon Cooks, Josh Reynolds, are pretty much every down players because they run three wide receivers on the field on like 97% of their snaps. Now, as his game logs show, he's going to be boomer bust and he's going to have a low floor with a high ceiling. But I think what's more important is to kind of look at the snap positions of the wide receiver. So I made this little cute little chart for y'all. If y'all fucks with this chart, I would very much appreciate thumbs up. Scroll down a little bit, hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you are new, because we're always breaking shit down like this at the HQ. Damn, my rhymes are on point today. But these are the LA wide receivers. And what it is, is I was looking at their percentage of snaps that they ran in the slot. So from weeks one to six, you can clearly see that Cup was the main slot receiver, right? And Robert Woods ran about a third of his routes from the slot. In week seven to eight, when Cooper Cup was hurt, we saw that Robert Woods took over the Cooper Cup role. Josh Reynolds slid into the Robert Woods role. So Woods will become the slot wide receiver here. Josh Reynolds will take over Woods' position as the outside wide receiver because we see Brandon Cooks running 80% of his routes from the outside. He's not really a slot guy. So that's how it works. Woods will take over the Cup position. Reynolds will take over the Woods position. Their next three matchups, they play Kansas City in Mexico, man. Ay -ay -ay -ay! This shit's going to be crazy. I can't actually wait for this game. Um, I don't know when this game is in terms of i'm sure the nfl fucked it up and like they're not going to be a primetime game and like the cowboys are going to be primetime again i want to see when this game is wow there you go it's actually monday night football next week with an over under of 63 and a half holy shit mexico was gonna love food the ball after this that's gonna be a dope game um should be extremely high scoring so all three wide receivers are absolutely in play to be started next week um how much would i put on josh reynolds honestly not that much i think like Depending on what you need at wide receiver, probably maximum $10, 10% fab budget. Maybe more than that because you're not going to find a lot of receivers who are going to get this type of usage off the wire in such a good offense. So maybe he's maybe he's worth a little bit more than that, but I'm not going to get too high because we've seen his, his floor and it's not a good one. Um, so those are the top wide receivers I would be looking to target. Uh, I want to talk about a few other guys like Willie Sneed and Kiki QT are other guys that I had on this list in week nine, but they had a buy in week 10. So I'm not going to go into their analysis. If you want to see analysis on them, you could just look at last week's waiver wire video. So Sneed and QT are both guys I think are good pickups as well at wide receiver. Uh, we have the news that Brandon Marshall just got signed to the Saints. With Des Bryant tearing his Achilles, he's gone, of course, like a fucking eight seconds into practice. Actually, it was like the last player practice, I think. But regardless, Brandon Marshall signs with the Saints. He was pretty horrible with the Seahawks this year. Um, Traquan Smith, however, has been ridiculously disappointing, man. Zero catches in the game where they put up 51 points. Um, but they do have the Eagles next week. 
and the Eagles have been very, very bad on the outside defending wide receivers, and they just lost Ronald Darby for the year with a torn ACL. Their cornerback depth is horrible right now. They have, like, nobody even remotely healthy uh, at the cornerback position. So Breeze should chuck it up for, like, 400 fucking yards in this one, and um, someone's going to benefit from that. It will probably end up being a mix of Kamara, Ingram, and Thomas, and literally no one else is going to matter, but... Just something to keep an eye on. Um, if you want to get cute and start Marshall or Traquan Smith, I ain't going to be really mad at you. It's probably not a good idea, but I don't know. The, the, the process, the analysis behind it adds up. I know a lot of people are always like, process over results, process over results, but maybe your process fucking sucks if it never gives results. Y'all ever thought about that? Probably have, but, but, but either of those plays are probably okay. We're going to move on to the tight end position, and there's not a lot on the wire right now. And it's Vance McDonald on here again. He's 51% owned. He's a guy that is continuously on this list. He took advantage of the five-touchdown game that Ben had on Thursday Night Football last week against the friendliest fantasy tight end matchup you could possibly have. Carolina caught all four of his targets for 44 yards and a touchdown. He's been far from consistent, but consistency is something you are not going to find in fantasy football at the tight end position outside of Kelsey and Ertz. McDonald at least at least gives you um, upside, right? Whereas like a guy like Ozuma, Ozama, whatever, for the Bengals really doesn't give you any upside, but he gives you opportunity, I guess. Um, I would much rather have Vance McDonald. He gives you the upside. He gives you. He's an athlete, right? He's a he's someone who gives you that yak, and yak I think is extremely important for kind of predicting success of tight ends. And I think you need to be able to move after the ball in order to have that top five sort of upside. And uh, I think week 11 in particular is a good matchup. While you look at it first glance, you see at Jacksonville, you're like, eh. Um, but for a few reasons, Vance is a good stream in week 11. Because if you go back to their last meeting in the playoffs, playoffs, they played against Jacksonville, Pittsburgh did. And Vance McDonald caught 10 of 16 targets for 112 yards. And that was when Jacksonville's defense was actually good. Right now, they are not that um, they're coming off back-to-back -back games in which they've allowed multiple scores to the tight end position. Ebron had three on Sunday, um, and in the week prior, their their game prior to the Colts, it was before their bye week, uh, both Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, Goddard sorry, will play, I mean, what the fuck am I saying? Um, both of the Philadelphia Eagles tight ends score touchdowns in that game. So they've allowed multiple tight ends, five touchdowns to the tight end position over their previous two games. This is a matchup to exploit right now. They are not the Jacksonville Jaguars pass defense that they were in previous years. That being said, I mean, would it surprise me if McDonald caught one pass for 17 yards? No. Would it surprise me if he went six for 65 and a touchdown? Also no. And I don't think a lot of guys have that upside on the wire. So I like McDonald. Um, Jeff Hefe, Hefe H from the Broncos was on a bye in week 10. So uh, if you want his analysis, go back to the previous week. I think he is probably my second favorite waiver wire pickup for week 11. He is 5% owned. Let's move into the streamers. Defense of streamers. Now, as I always say, what you look for in a defensive streamer, favorites to win the game. Teams playing at home with low over under totals. First up on this list is the Baltimore Ravens. Actually, I don't have the point spread for any of these games. Let me see if they update it. We gonna update this motherfucker real time. Okay, they do. Cool. Although they don't have the over unders yet, but I I'd imagine that the Ravens are gonna be favored. Ah, they don't have it up. Actually, give me two seconds while I go on to my sports book and see if they got something something for us. Work with a young player. Okay, cool. They got some matchups for us. First up on this list was the Ravens. Oh, fuck. They don't, okay. They don't have it on there, of course, because they don't know who the quarterback is. Anytime where the quarterback is in question, they won't have the spreads of the, the point spreads on the list. So I would say the first one to keep an eye on is the Baltimore Ravens. They're 52% owned. They're going to be playing the Bengals at home. Second is the New Orleans Saints versus the Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, man, they're killing me. They're not going to have this game on here either, probably, huh? Okay, well, I expect the Saints to be pretty heavily favored. Their defense is getting better as the year progresses, and the Eagles' offense looks to be worse and worse. So, um, Saints is a good one. My favorite one is probably the Cardinals. 13% owned. They're playing at home against the Raiders. And let me guess. they don't. Oh, they do. So, the Cardinals are actually three and a half point favorites at home with a point total of 40 and a half, the lowest over-under of the week. So, the Cardinals are going to be a very good defensive stream. And I always end up leaving out a few plays as the week progresses, like I forget to put them on here, but I don't see too many that I love. Houston Texans, they're probably not that widely available, but they are three point favorites. They're at Washington, which is fine because their offense is fucking horrible. 42 and a half over under, which is very low. So I like the Texans, but they're probably not that widely available. Yeah, those are my top streamers, I think, for week. Hey, that bone.
that wraps up the video, guys. Um, and like I said, if you want to enter the contest for the Jersey Jungle giveaway, all you got to do is follow me on Instagram. Follow the Jersey Jungle on Instagram. If you want to follow the Big Dogs Fantasy account, you could do that as well. All that will be linked in the description. Make sure you check me out on Patreon.com where I'm giving away my weekly rankings where we do a private live stream every Wednesday night where we answer all your sit start questions and it's a little bit of a community thing going on over there. Patreon.com slash BDGE. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up. Drop a comment down below. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you're listening via podcast, a rating and review would be very, very, very much appreciated. Let's me know you appreciate my work. Let's me know that I should keep putting these videos out. So me and my mans know we'll see you on Thursday's video of Top Trade Targets. Let us know down below who you think is some of the best buy low, sell high candidates. 